Hay una nota que está vendando.
Uh, to our visitors uh, from the Innovation Poverty Action and Northwestern University uh, Global Poverty Research Lab. Colleagues uh, here at PIDS and those watching through WebEx and at the PIDS uh, Facebook page, welcome to the webinar. Today, we are honored to have Professor Dean Carla, who is visiting us today and talk about uh, focusing capabilities for social protections, collection of studies. Professor Carlan is uh, the president and founder of the Innovation Poverty Action, a nonprofit organization dedicated to discovering and promoting solutions to global poverty problems and scaling up successful ideas uh, through implementation and dissemination to policymakers, practitioners, and investors and donors. He is also the Frederick Esser Nimmers uh, Distinguished Professor of Economics uh, and Finance at the Northwestern University uh, Kellogg School of Management and Director, Co-Director of the Global Budget Research Lab. Professor Carlan's research uh, focuses on micro issues of poverty, typically employing experimental methodologies and behavioral economic insights to examine what works and what does not, and why to address your problems. This work spans many geographies and topics, including sustainable income generation for those in object poverty, credit and savings markets for low-income households, agriculture for small farmer, uh, small farmers, small and medium entrepreneurs, and smoking station and charitable giving. Professor Carlan, thank you. Uh, for taking the time to visit us here at PIDS and sharing valuable and cutting-edge uh, research with all of us. To our viewers, uh, we look forward to you having a fruitful discussion with you in the open forum. After the talk, uh, we have an open forum that will be moderated by Dr. Sher, a manager for uh, information services. Floor is yours. Thanks. What's up? Is that better? Okay. Um, this is so much fun to be in person again, um, even though I can only see half of everybody. Um, but half is so much better than Zoom. Um, this is actually my first research trip since 2019. So thank you for welcoming me here. Um, so I wanted to share a, um, a collection of projects that are basically all trying to understand um, in different ways how much what we're calling capabilities, um, capabilities meaning um, the you know kind of the mental health, the the behavioral kind of instincts, aspirations. Um, it's a, kind of a collection a collection of concepts that we mean when we say capabilities about how one is able to use the resources around one both in terms of planning, fulfilling those plans. And this is affected by many things that are, you know, often intertwined with concepts within mental health. And, you know, what we see is a lot of, a lot of programs, and I'm going to be presenting several here, that are more economics-based programs that are trying to work with the world's forest to help them build sustainable sources of their own income. And to, in a very simplistic way, one of the things that is striking to us that we've seen, and I'll show you a few things about it, is that a lot of the, uh, you know, the, these programs that I'm going to share with you have a fair amount of success, but at the same time, it's not a success for all. Now, nothing ever works perfectly. Let's just be clear. That's a bit too high of an aspiration. So, but having said that, when we see the kind of separation that we feel like we're, we're observing in some of these studies, where some people really did really well with it and others less so, it makes us want to ask, well, what's going on that this, many, this much in resources is provided to a household and they're not able to grab these resources and, and, and prosper? And so that's kind of one of the underlying motivations uh, in this. And, and it's kind of in the spirit of that, it's, it's, it's part of what we're seeing is what I might refer to as graduation 2.0. The graduation being a set of programs I'm about to share with you with the 2.0, meaning the first iteration of the test was just testing does it work, found really good success, and the 2.0 is now figuring out, like, how can we do better? Okay, so that's the prelude. 
Um, the basic premise behind a lot of these programs I'm about to share with you is in some sense, it's a sim simple message that I think conveys a lot of the philosophy behind it. It does actually create some problems uh, between us here, um, which I'll explain in a second. But the basic premise starts with the idea and recognition that the cause of poverty is complicated. Um, I'm always struck by anybody who thinks they can give a TED talk to explain the root cause of poverty. Um, anybody who thinks they can do that is, you know, to, I, I, you know makes me cringe. Um, but, you know, and the fact that it's so complicated is, uh, you know, and, and again, this is a somewhat simplistic way of, of concluding this, but it's probably why singular approaches have not done so great. And it, it's not to say none of them have had shown some success. In fact, cash transfers probably is like the single singular approach that has like the most positive evidence for a particular approach. But if you think about microcredit, if you think about training programs, a lot of these are singular approaches which have some modest impacts, but nothing that really takes somebody in. And like five years later, we tend to see like really large average impacts. And so the basic premise of a series of programs, which I'll start off with sharing, um, that in the early days we referred to as graduation programs, more broadly put them under the umbrella of what we call just a multifaceted social protection program. A little bit more of a mouthful than graduation, but graduation, um, you know, uh, um, is a uh, it's kind of a weird phrase too, to be honest. It, and it has some old history to it that's not so interesting. So, but the basic premise is work on multiple things at once. That when you're working with a household, the kind of the simplistic way of explaining it would be, you know, if a cat if a household lacks information about how to how to raise pigs, but also lacks capital for how to that they need to buy some starter pigs. Then if you just hand them capital, they, they don't start a piggery because they don't know how to, they don't know the technical. And if you just tell them about how to start a piggery, but you don't give them the money to start it, they kind of look at you and go, well, that wasn't so helpful. I mean, can, can I have some pigs? Um, and so that's a very simple example but then of, of what, what we mean by work on many problems at once. The problem with, and so uh, actually, so here's the kind of rough timeline, the way this program typically rolls out. And we have done a test now with Dole here in the Philippines. And we, um, the, the results are not in this presentation, but we find some really nice positive impact in the program. So the program typically starts on that slide, that one. I'll look that. Um, with some market analysis and targeting, market analysis being to try to understand what likelihoods make sense to promote in this context, in this market for these people. And targeting is about targeting um, poor households. In some contexts, like with, um, like here in the Philippines, there's already a targeting process that's, that somebody else has already done, maybe a government cash transfer program. So a lot of cases, it's just it's just kind of piggybacking off of that targeting. But in other contexts, we've seen this done. Uh, it's, a, it's its own targeting system. And then at the very beginning of the program, there's basically five different components that are rolled out, some, somewhat a little bit sequenced, but for the most part, these are just kind of launched um, all in the early phases of the program. There's life skills coaching, which often takes place as in the context of a weekly or monthly visit from the um, nonprofit or the government that is rolling this out to the household, trying to help help them set plans. This is a little bit like the capabilities aspect, but not, it's not too heavy, but this is basically what that is trying to do. And also it is information, right? It is like, hey, what are the problems you're facing with your pigs or your goats or whatever the case is? Um, there's consumption support. In the case of a program that is overlaid on an existing government program, a lot of times that's not, there's no like additional consumption support, but because they're already overlaying this on top of a cash transfer program that the government's already doing. There's um, uh, always a promotion of savings so that when they start generating income out of their income generating activity, they they are they have an easy easy on ramp to putting that money in a bank or an informal savings group. And there's the technical skills training on what whatever the likelihood is, and and then the the key the kind of the biggest piece of it from a cost perspective is the asset transfer, and that's also a biggest piece of it in terms of participation. Usually, when this program is done you get something in the border of like 99 to 100% of people participating. And undoubtedly that's because there's a large answer. Asset transfer of three to four, $500, so usually three to $400 of assets that are transferred. Um, there have been a few cases where people turned down the program, uh, but those are kind of 
unique situation that we actually did have it happen here in Dole, but that had to do with like the timing of the way it got rolled out. Um, in most places, it's about 100% participation. And like I said, and I, th I think if the asset transfer were not part of it, it probably would not get 100% participation. Um, so, that, um, so the first order question is the simplistic. Can it work? Um, the original test, we had eight sites of the original test. Uh, the Bangladesh is in red. That was done by some other researchers. Then we put together the six that are in yellow into a paper in science um, that was published in 2015. Um, the Yemen site was originally supposed to be part of those six. It was supposed to be seven, um, but the, the civil war in Yemen prevented us from doing any measurement for four years. And so it was not part of that initial paper because we, did, we couldn't get the data. Uh, we did eventually get the data, um, and that paper has been published separately. Happy to send, have send both of these to people. They're also both on my website. Um, the striking thing, and you know, a lot of times, um, and for those of you who have been involved in program evaluations, you probably have had this experience as well. Most of the times that I'm looking at results from a study where we have 10 things that we're measuring, we say, okay, this program we hope is going gonna, gonna to be microcredit, it's going to be a training program, and we hope it's going to increase business profits, we hope it's going to increase labor supply, we hope it's going to increase consumption, we hope it's going to increase food security, and then and then people are going to save some of it, and then their physical health will get better, and their mental health will get better, and we measure 10 different things. And usually we face the problem that, you know, three, maybe four go up, and the others don't. And then we have to try to, you know, grapple with whether that's uh, just because the results were weak on some, didn't exist. Um, obviously, when you have too many things you test, and you find like, you know, the canonical statistical challenges, if you test 20 things and one goes up, then, you, then you're then very much subject to the idea that that's not a real result, that's just spurious. So this thing that was, you know, first time in my career that I had experienced this, every single thing that we measured impact on, that the program was designed to try to move the needle on, went up. And I'd actually never had that happen where just everything went up. So we have per capita consumption went up. These are standard deviation movements. The two lines are at two years and three years. So the three years is really trying to get it at persistence and how, how long does it last? Um, per, up 0.12 standard deviations, household index went up, food security, amount borrowed, um, savings. Um, saving for what it's worth is a side story. Most of that is driven by one site that did the savings a little bit differently and, and really jacked up savings by a lot. The, the savings for the most was, was a bar that was about the same size as the other bars. Um, labor supply went up, um, physical health, mental health, and as well as even a political index. There was nothing about this that was trying to be political. The, by political here, what, it, what we're referring to is, um, did you attend community meetings, things of this nature? Not like literally, not like super politics, but just community engagement and, and that went up. Um, and, and it was cost effective. These are the six sites. Um, it did not do well in Honduras. The assets that were transferred were mostly chickens and the chickens in year two got sick and, and a virus spread through them and died. And so it did cause harm to the whole program, which does point out that, you know, this is not like, you know, easy peasy run this program. The, the, the asset that is selected, the model needs to be thought carefully in terms of the, the risk um, that might be um, germane for it. Um, but here's one of the key ones that I mentioned in the very beginning. These are percentile um, results. And so striking thing here is at the upper end of the, of the distribution, we see these huge treatment effects. But at the low end, it's pretty flat. Right? And so we, um, you, know, you know, what this tells us is that if, if everybody had the same exact treatment effect, if everybody was just 0.2 standard deviations better off, regardless of where they were in the distribution, then this would be a, a flat, a, a series of bars that were equal height. So this is what motivated, this slide here motivates a lot of the work that I'm now gonna start sharing, which is on, on capabilities, where we have moved into a second phase of this. Um, and, and so, and that's the focus of what I wanna talk about now. Um, so, there's two different parts of this, and I'm going to share with you some, uh, like I said, a collection from a few different studies that were part of that, that original six, but th that were kind of side studies to those six, but also some new studies that are now underway. Where we, um, one of them is actually coming out in Nature in like today's the 25th, and on Thursday. So um, 
Um, and um, so we're pretty excited about that. And then, and then some others are still working working papers. So the first question we want to know is: Is capital a sufficient constraint to relax? Right. And so one way of thinking about this is: Does adding capabilities components affect outcome? Right. Um, and because we know that capital constraint, we we know that capital is relaxable in a sense, right? We know that if we give someone money and they were constrained before on money and we give them some money that we can relax that constraint. So it doesn't say we satisfy all of the needs they have, but we can relax that constraint. Um, what we wanna know is if it's a sufficient constraint to relax. And if it's sufficient, well, that tells us that the capabilities doesn't really matter, right? And, or we don't necessarily know that it's capabilities, but we just know that like we don't need other things. Just doing the capital alone is good. The second question to ask is, are capabilities a sufficient constraint to relax, right? And there, that's also, we do need to also first ask the first order question, which is, are they relaxable? That's not something we know these easily, right? With money, we know we can relax that, we can't someone money. If we run a program to try to help someone build capabilities, improve mental health, improve their ability to take, take make a plan and take action and fulfill that plan, Will that work? Will that improve mental health? Will that help them make plans? That I don't know. So we need to also establish just that as a first stage. So um, part of this, and um, this is, I want to talk a little bit more, um, you know, methodological for just a moment, not about this program in particular, but just kind of partly explaining our thinking for how we're trying to organize some of these studies. Because, you know, I think about there is a kind of a sequence of learning. And we started off with a series of like that science paper, which had six sites plus Yemen, which basically established that something worked. So that's the weather. We did the random, we randomized it so that it helps us establish causality. And that establishes whether A causes B and by how much. A, B is, is the program. B is any one of those outcomes that we care about. We know that A caused B to move, and we actually have an estimate of how much. So how do we learn why, right? Why did it work, right? And, and we asked this not merely, you know, we are interested in this as academics, trying to understand more about why the world works as it works and social phenomena work. So there's a part of us which is kind of, uh, is kind of in that sense, curious as, as academics. Um, but for most of us, and I'm guessing this is true of everybody in this room as well, we're not sitting here because we're just curious people. We, we are curious people. It's how we chose this job or other roles that we could play. But we're probably also here because we just care about the problems in the world and we think of evidence and research as a path to making the world a better place. And so we don't just ask these questions because we're curious. We also ask them because they have very clear implications. If we know why something is working, they tell us something about how to do it. They tell us we had a target because if you know why something's working that might actually give you insights about who it's going to work best for and who it's not going to work well for um they might also give you implications for unmeasured aspects if you know something about the why things that maybe were a little bit beyond what you're able to survey for but if you're interested in why it's working it might give you some insights about some some unmeasured aspects of a program it's also important for implications for replication and extension visibility um, viability so it worked in that context. Will it work somewhere else? A different country. Just put up these sites from around the world. Not a single one was the Philippines. But even within the Philippines, suppose we did it in Lusan, found it work. Will it work in, in Mindanao? Different context. Some of it is going to have some similarities. Some of it will translate. Maybe other parts not. It could be things that are about the culture, but it also could just be about markets and access to markets and Transaction costs, proximity to proximity to roads. There's a, a lot of different reasons why something might work better or not. Um, it's not always easy to know all those factors, but that's what we mean by asking this why question. And then also the implications for modification and improvement. If we know why something worked, not only does it tell us, in a sense, like oh, you know, target these people but not those people, but then for the people you're not targeting, you might want to say, well. But they were poor. It's not that we're not targeting them because they weren't poor. We're not, we're not targeting them because once we understood more about the why of the program, we realized it's not good for them. Well, what is, what is right for them? And how can you modify the program to maybe, maybe work there? So how do we ask why is different? 
And here there's a few different paths um, that I and I kind of divide these things up in my head to so these these different these different tools that are within our toolkit that are a little bit you know more nuanced than just randomizing, which is what we do to get at the weather whether it worked. So the first is through data. Qualitative data can really help a lot in many contexts. Um, we have a project in Bolivia, as an example, that we did where we rolled out a commitment savings product in the Amazon area. Very, very remote. Like you had to take a canoe to, uh, to for eight hours to get to this area of the Amazon where, where you have communities that are really separated from markets. They're, they're, they literally have to get in a canoe and, 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 and row for a couple hours just to get to something that you would call a village. Um, so they're very on pocket societies rolled out this commitment savings. Um, and the idea that in collaboration with the anthropologists that we were working with, who had been working there for decades, was that this commitment savings would help people save up for tools to improve their yields and their farm and, and cookware and things of this nature. Turns out they saved up for alcohol. Like bottled alcohol you could buy, like 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 that back there. <laughs> um, and um, and we were surprised. Um, blood pressure went up too for men, especially the men who did it. And so we went back and did a lot of qualitative work afterwards to share some of these results back with communities, try to learn. And the qualitative work really helped us understand more about the why. So that's one process. A second is more process and short run data. Um, and that helps get at sometimes the sequencing when you can see the sequencing in which changes take place through process data. You might not necessarily have that next to a counterfactual, but let me just, you know, a very simple example would be knowing participation rates. If you know, if you, if you have a program that doesn't work, this is going to sound really stupid, but it's a, just a fully a good example of what I mean by this. If you have a program that you got a null result, the first thing you want to know is did people participate? Right. If they didn't participate much, well, that explains your null result. And that helps you understand the why. Now you want to know why didn't they participate, which is a great second question. But at least you get the first order one, which is you're getting a, a null because they didn't participate. Um, and so process data like that can help shed insight into what's going on. And if there's different components to your program and you want to know why the program worked, well, knowing how they participated in the different components can maybe give you some insight as well. If there were some components that there was very low participation rates, well, you probably know it wasn't because of that component. Um, also, long run data can go a long way to, um, to help. So I'll share some results in that spirit. A second way is to randomize treatment arms, right? This is um, a lot of times when we do studies, we do more nuanced studies. Take, take my example earlier about the piggery and the information and the capital. Like you want to understand something about the why there, the obvious thing to do is have three treatment arms. Some people get the pigs, some people get information about pigs, and other people get both. Boom, there you go. But that required knowing up front, this is our exact research question, and we could design the experiment around that. A lot of times you don't know what that's going to be, and you only learn that after the process. And then and the last is testing for sources of heterogeneity. Uh, sometimes this is across participants, sometimes it's across program sites. But a lot of times the why, for instance, would be if you want to, if you do an information program and one theory as to why a program that provides information works is that people lacked information. Makes sense. But there's other reasons why an information program could work. It also could just be a signal to people that this is a good idea. Maybe they knew all the information beforehand, but now they trust the information more. So they kind of knew the answers. They would have gotten them right if you'd asked them, but they just didn't believe it. They didn't act on it, they didn't, right? And so that's a very different story. So if you know something about what information they had prior to your study, then you can look and see whether your treatment effect is bigger on the people who had more information versus less information. If it's no different, it tells you it worked, but not because it was informative, even though it was providing information, something else was going on. Um, and, and so, um, um, you know, as, as any, you know, give you an example of something like that is that we have a project in Ghana where we're providing agricultural advice to, to farmers. And the striking thing there is that, um, the, when we ask, when we give them a battery of questions, like a test, basically in a survey, we have a pre and a post. Um, we ask them about 10 different questions that are technical questions about 
optimal um, about optimal farming technique. As a result of our extension work, we basically see no meaningful change in their knowledge, none whatsoever. For what it's worth, it was a really weird result that struck her as a, as a side note, since you're all you know kind of in the space of evaluation. Um, in this kind of research. It was actually a statistically significant, but no, that it was kind of a weird, uh, it, it was, it was just so precisely estimated that it was statistically significant. But when you think about the magnitude of it, you're like, that's nothing. It was like, we, we were, it was a statistically significant shift in getting from an average of like 72 to 73%. Okay. Now, that's just not meaningful, like to go from an average of 7.2 questions right out of 10 to an average of 7.3. So we conclude from that that there was no learning, even though that actually was statistically significant. Um, but practice has changed. So no knowledge went up. There was teaching people to do things. No knowledge changed. Um, but they were more likely to take action on that knowledge. Right? And so that helps us understand something about the why, that it's not so much about the knowledge per se, but about the willingness to act on that knowledge that changed from the extension. And that, that as we see it, is a useful insight. Okay, that was my methodological aside. I hope that was helpful or useful to think through. Um, so back to, our, back to these studies. Are assets sufficient? So in this study, the reason there's a picture of a goat there is because we gave away goats. Um, we did this on the side of this study that I already mentioned with, with graduation. We had extra treatment arms also, and one of them was just transferring goats to people, nothing more. Um, and so here, what we have is um, the GUP. GUP stands for Graduating Out of Ultra Poverty, which is the name of the graduation program, the multifaceted multi program. So this is one of the six sites from that science paper that I mentioned. And, um, and the thing that's most important to notice here is that what I want you to focus on is the final column, the asset only, that's just handing them goats. So the blue and the orange are the two different versions of the graduation program with and without a savings component. So this is where we always see these nice, pretty big positive treatment effects. But when we just transfer people assets, which is the, 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 fourth, the fourth bar, zero across everything. But here's kind of an interesting thing. So this now shows you the full graduation program is the blue bar, and the orange bar is the, the go drop. We'll refer to it as the go drop, um, uh, which is a joke that works in America, but probably but nowhere else, it seems. <laughs> um, and um, so, and here's the striking thing that we found, which is the value of goats. Uh, this is um, either two or three years after the goats were transferred. I can't remember which, but it's the same basic result, whether it was two or three years. And you notice that we do see a big impact on the quantity of goats that they have. So we gave out goats, two to three years later, they got more goats. Remember, nothing else, nothing's changing in their life, realistically. Consumption's the same, asset value's the same, income's the same, food security's the same, financial food, everything else, everything's the same that we actually care about. Yeah. Um, it was done in pairs, and in, um, I'm, I'm pretty sure they did. They were hip to the whole um, fornication thing. Um, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I can't. You're making me wonder that could they have done something as silly as not done that? But I don't think so. I mean, that was like they do. They are. They they did. They did take you know second grade biology. <laughs> thing. Um, so, um, so then so the goats go up. So they, they do keep the goats and they and they rear them. But notice the second column, livestock value excluding goats goes down. Right? So the net net total livestock, no bad. So one way of interpreting this, there's a few ways you can interpret it, to be clear. But one way that we look at this, I think of this is this is this might be capabilities. The program didn't do anything at all to try to help the household say, add this to what you're doing. Don't replace other things. Just add this and do more, right? And the idea of taking on more things was not something that they were comfortable doing. So they took on the goats and sold off some sheep or sold off some other things. Um, the program might have been successful, just to be clear. Like when, when we see this, you might say, oh, that means it didn't work at all. No, that, do not conclude that because we have no measure of 
how much they ate over those two years. Right? This is at the end of two years or three years that we see that. So they might have it might have been a perfectly good program as a cash, as the equivalent of a cash transfer, but done in the form of goats, where they're better off. They ate some goats. They ate better. Things were good for them. It's just that at the end of two years, nothing nothing continued to persist. So the next question is: Are assets necessary? And by the way, please do stop me too. I mean, you're welcome to ask more. And like, if anybody else has questions, please don't don't be shy. <laughs> uh, totally, totally welcome. Um, just you know. so the next one I want to ask is: Are are they necessary? How much action can we generate without including that asset? Now, remember, I mentioned earlier we get like 100% participation rates. Here we actually do have um, super high, I, I think 100% as well, participation rates without the asset. But I have seen some other cases where you drop the asset and then you see some lower. So in this case, this is in Uganda. We're working in a refugee context. So it's a bit, that has a bit of a different aspect as well. These are refugees from the Congo um, living in Western, Western Uganda. Now the way it works with uh, the refugee communities in Uganda is there's always host communities that are right next to where the refugee area is. And so all programs in refugee areas always have like a pairing to them where you also provide similar services in the host area. And that's done partly for kind of obvious political um, fairness sense of, you know, how, making sure that the host communities don't resent the refugees for getting all these things and stuff like this. Um, but, you know, it, we end up we're, we're evaluating, we end up evaluating both. We actually find very few differences in impact across the two continents. So in this, I'm not going to present all the nitty gritty. So I want to just focus on the likelihood. I mean, I'm sorry, the capabilities aspects. But we have three treatments and a control. The first is a full program with individual coaching. A second is a full program, but with group coaching. So that coaching is about that information and the capabilities building. Um, and the difference here, there's you know, good reason, and this was actually tested here with Dolly as well, this idea of individual and group coaching. You could easily imagine a pro and a con both ways. Uh, on one hand, individual coaching, it's one-on-one. -on -one. It's I'm meeting with Pratap. Pratap can, you know, um, get some more attention from me in that coaching. Um, and maybe he also was willing to share things with me that he's not willing to share in a group. And so I'm able to help in that way. Um, but the group aspect, you know, maybe Pratap comes to the group meeting and shares, and Nash has had a similar problem. And so I, as the coach, am able to actually say, well, what did you do, Nash? And then Nash shares, and that helps Pratap more, and it helps even more than it would happen if Pratap just said, turned to me and said, what do you think I should do? Or, and, I, you know, and that actually helps more. Um, no, it is cheaper to do group. So there's a very practical reason why, from a program perspective, group works. Um, better. And that was actually one of the motivations in, with the Dole study that we did here was because you just, you can reach more people and hold those meetings and, you know, all 20 are there, 30 are there, you hold the meeting, boom, you, you're, you're just, your throughput in terms of how many people can be in a program per employee goes much higher. And, and that is one of the main constraints that I've seen time and time again working with government uh, is that when you say, great, this thing worked, we did it in 300 villages, and the government says, great, we have, we have 30,000 villages, and so that would need a team of 1,000 employees to run this program, and we don't have 1,000 employees that are trained and able to run this kind of program. So how do we do that? And, and the group, group approach is one of, the, one of the ideas behind that. Okay, so that's the two. The, the third one, and this is the focus on what I want to focus on here, is the individual coaching, but with no asset. So it's basically treatment one, but no assets. And the question is, if you do everything but transfer the goats or the equivalent of the goats, how much action can you get? And the answer is, you can get a decent amount of action, but it's not as big. So the, the answer is to what's optimal is going to come out to, you know, something that's going to be very nuanced about the ratios because it's cheaper, right? So one thing to notice is that we see no difference between T1 and T2, the individual group coaching. So that if that's right and that persists, then T2 wins because T2 is cheaper. Okay. But the difference between T2 and T3 is less obvious. As you can see, the point estimates on productive asset value, promoted livelihoods, food security are all, um, you know, all positive for T3 but not as big. And so the obvious answer to what's optimal is going to be partly about what the differential cost is and the cost ratios. 
um, so that you know, with a million dollars, ten million dollars, whatever the budget is of the government of the program, um, you know, the question is how can they optimize in that way? But one of the things that's striking about P3 is it shows you that this was a program which was really basically providing information, access to savings with informal savings groups, and a big push on capabilities, and it actually increased economic outcomes without any economic like any sellable asset being transferred, so to speak, right? It was all information and training, and yet to generate these kinds of inputs. So that's a promising result. Um, similarly, attached to this, uh, the Ghana site of the six, we actually set up a, um, a bag making operation. We made 115,579 of these um, Ghanaian bags. Um, there's one of them that's actually, um, I'm, I'm thrilled to say, is part of the Nobel Museum in Stockholm because when um, Abhijit Banerjee won the Nobel Prize in 2019, the museum there, um, basically all the Nobel laureates are asked to donate some something, some 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 physical thing that is symbolic of their research in some way, some way um, for a little exhibit in the museum to each of the laureates. So um, he he donated one of these bags. Uh, so, um, so in this project, basically by setting up a bag making operation, what we were trying to do is have a good measure of labor productivity, one that we can measure directly by asking people to make bags, paying them to do them and seeing how well they do with them. And then we can see that this basically becomes an outcome measure of the program. So we ran the program, treatment and control, that was this graduation program, but then as an outcome, we look at bag productivity. And oops, I'm sorry, I don't have, I didn't put up charts for that. But what do we find? When you have that graduation program, you work more on the bags, more hours. And keep in mind, the graduation program actually does take up time. But yet, even with that, they still work even more on bags. They put out more effort per hour, and they were more capable of completing complex bags. So we randomized whether they were kind of easy or hard to make. One of the most important results, which is not germane to what I'm talking about here, but I'm going to mention it anyhow, is that there was no negative income effect. This is one of the big issues that a lot of programs, whether it's a cash transfer or any sort of any sort of social protection program, always kind of, you know, is is raised. It's not forward. But if you transfer money to low-income households, you just in, you know disincentivize work. Um, and we find the exact opposite. And, and quite frankly, we're finding this very consistently across lots of contexts. That, that That is like one of the worst things, in my opinion, that we ever did as economists, is teach this in Economics 101, that there's this labor-leisure trade-off and income effects mean that you, lay, you produce more leisure and less labor. And it's like right out of Economics 101, and it's just a really horrible, horrible thing that we've implanted on anybody who took Econ 101 and nothing more because the data just don't actually support that that's actually happening at this level. I don't doubt that there's some level at which that's true, but that is just not anything that bears truth in low-income households that I've seen. Yeah. We find the opposite. Overall labor supply increases, increased. And this is true in other contexts too that we've seen. We have a we have a COVID cash transfer study in Ghana. We're finding the same thing. Transfer cash for people, labor supply went up. I, ironically, you kind of they wanted it to go down. That's <laughs> it was a cash transfer to deal with COVID. So um, I think we're seeing the same thing in a Peru study too. The cash transfers led to more work. Okay. Um, last, and then I think the last one. In here is a is a this is the study that I was referring to that is coming out in a couple days in in Nature, in Niger. This was built on top of existing cash transfer programs. So the government in Niger was already already had had a program providing cash transfers. They already did the targeting to find low income households and to providing them um, either weekly or monthly cash transfers for the sake of food food security. This program was also implemented by government, which was important uh, for the kind of move for this kind of space because to get you know it's interesting to see the effectiveness with nonprofits working at you know at, at kind of deep penetration but still somewhat smaller scale not hitting a country as a whole and then trying to see like okay how well can we make this work under under a government implementation um, we're finding that it's cost effective after eight, only 18 months and so as long as the benefits persist after that it's going to do really really well um, the, the basic program has 
Here, this is where we really amplified the capabilities part. Um, the psychosocial components, it was not just the, the household visits that I mentioned before. There was actually a video that was, that was produced that was shared in these community meetings that took place that were specifically about building role models and helping to increase hope and aspiration for households. Um, and then along with that was a life skills training. Um, and so here we have three different treatment arms, a capital package that was basically like the core, that was the closest to what I've been sharing with you before, the capital package. Then there's the psychosocial package, which did not include the cash grants, no lump sum cash grant, not no $300, Here's the cash to go buy the goats or the pigs and things like that. But it did include the psychosocial, the, the, ampl the amplified psychosocial. And then there's the full package, which includes both the cash grants and the psychosocial. So again, just to repeat, the capital package is closest to what I've been showing you from other sites because it was it included the lump sum cash grants and not the amplified psychosocial aspect. And the full is um, is now the full package, but it's actually more than, than, than a lot of the other countries have done so far. This is also part of a four country site, although we just have the Niger study in health yet. That's a map of Niger. That's another map. Oh, I can skip this. So here's the, here are the, um, some of the, uh, just a few of the key results. So on mental health, we are seeing um, the, um, the control is, is basically zero. I'm sorry, that's not very clear the way that's done. So because these are all treatment effects. So the control is, is shouldn't really be on that index, apologies. Um, and everything else is relative to control. So the capital um, is producing a 0.15 standard deviation increase in, in, in mental health. Remember, that one did not actually have a big component that was deliberately trying to target mental health because it doesn't have that psychosocial component. When the, you do the psychosocial without the capital, then we're at a 0.2 standard deviation improvement in mental health. And when you do everything together, then we're up to 0.25 derivation improvement. Um, and we see the same exact pattern for other measures uh, that are about capabilities and mental health, self-efficacy, and future expectations. Same exact pattern of the three. Um, we look at consumption and business revenue. We don't see quite that same um, um, pattern as stark, but it is there. I realize one thing that is confusing is um, we cha I changed the order of the bars on here just to keep you Keep you looking at the index. Um, it had nothing to do with me being lazy and not improving my slides. Um, this was the change that I told you I wanted to make. I knew it was not going to be something I could do on the fly on this morning. <laughs> um, so here, the blue is the full. That was the one that was the fourth bar before. And so that is having the biggest effect on gross consumption, food security, business revenue. It's not quite as stark as we saw on the last slide. But we do see the same basic pattern where that is the one that is working the best. Um, and then the capital and, and, and social are tend to be somewhat tied. Although, as you can see with business revenue, the capital does do better. Um, so, you know, this is, you know, as we, one of the things that's striking here is for what it's worth, when you look at gross consumption as the key outcome, the blue bar is highest, but it's also most expensive. So the yellow bar, the social bar, is actually the winner from this. If, if you think of consumption as the most important outcome, as the, the best proxy at the end of the day that aggregates up all the various things, um, then because that one's also um, about 65 to 70% the cost, I forget the exact percent, but it's it's enough of a drop in the cost because of, it doesn't have the capital grant, that it actually wins from a cost-effectiveness perspective. Having said that, it takes longer to achieve the impact. We look at the six month impacts, right? It's much further back. By 18 months, it cap is up. So it takes longer to get there. So it's a little bit of needing to put on like a social welfare hat about what exactly you're optimizing. If you're trying to optimize 18 months and onwards, then social wins. Depending on how much weight you put on those six months, 12 months, you might flip. Uh, what's encouraging is that they're all working. Okay, and then last. Last is the newest, um, and here's in Ghana, we're expanding the, we're, we're kind of ex taking the initial study that we did, and we're now working with a different partner, but doing a continued uh, graduation program in Ghana. And here, one of the key things is that we, again, we amplified here at the, the capabilities by running a cognitive behavioral therapy program 
prior to the graduation program. So this is different than the Niger, where Niger was simultaneous and built in. This one is sequenced. Let's do the cognitive behavior therapy first, and then let's run graduation. So what I'm about to share with you with the data that were collected in that in-between moment. We don't, um, not the, not the, at the end of the graduation. And so here we have, whoops, that's weird. A map of Ghana. I'll skip that. Sorry. Why is this? Uh... Okay. Oh no. Now it's like. Mm -hmm. Do you have control? Can you go back one? Yeah, go. No, no, no. Go back to the prior slide. I want to, uh, no, one more. One more. No, one more. There we go. Okay, so one thing one thing that's to know is that for men, nope, too far. Nope, too far. Go forward now. Nope, forward. Well, let me, I can talk to this while we get there. No, no, you want the wrong way. Go forward. Um, I just want to get, get to the slide that says transition matrix. So, um, so what I'm going to share with you is the results that are just on the cognitive behavioral therapy. And one of the things that was, um, that we, that we saw that surprised us was this was a program that was motivated because in, in some other panel data that we have, we saw that the rates of depression were really high in rural areas and like around 50 percent um, very you know this surprised us these are higher than we've seen elsewhere um and and meanwhile we met a psychologist um um who angela who's, who's one of the one of the co-authors with us on this work who was adapting a cognitive behavioral therapy program that had been tested elsewhere and had adapted it to ghana to be done in groups in rural areas. And so we worked with her to incorporate that into what we were doing, randomizing the promotion that program prior to the graduation program. The thing that I'm about to share with you that was striking is that the program was really effective for, check, uh, for improving depression rates, irrespective of whether someone was depressed at baseline. And one of the things that was striking as a first thing to notice is that the transition in and out of depression was really high. So it was a really high rate, but when we just look at the likelihood that you're, this is just in the control groups, so no one here got CBT. And as you can see from this, there's just a lot of movement in and out of, of, of being labeled depressed. Yeah. Why is there what? I have no idea. I, it's a great question, but don't know. Um, but you know, so that's you know that's it. And and you know, and to be fair, I can't actually. You know, and you could argue that too that there was a question about measurements, and you know, anytime that is measured, it's going to be um, subject to um, you know potential biases, just the way the questions are asked and survey staff is trained and things like this. So. You know, I'm very hesitant to make a comparative statement across places. What what we were just motivated by is given what we did observe. It was let me be clear. It was already on our mind to do psychosocial programs. It wasn't like this idea came out of nowhere. But when we saw that rate, it, it did strike us like this had you know potential problems. Um, it's not that the area has more poverty than anywhere else that we're dealing with and things like that. So I don't know. It's not like we can say like oh these people were poor in the continent. Um, but we do see this movement in and out, as you can see by the shades. Um, you know, the share above um, worsened mental health, 31%, 31% improved mental health, and 38% um, at the state of the same, you know, at the diagonal, right? And so that alone is, is a striking fact of how much movement there is in and out. And we think that's part of why we're seeing a strong treatment effect in this program, irrespective of your baseline status that it basically was effective for helping people who were depressed become less depressed, but it was also effective at helping people who were not identified as depressed to stay not depressed. So you want me to try and do it or do you want to control? Okay. So these are just the, um, the outcomes at three months from mental health index. We saw it go up by 0.15 deviations 
and self-efficacy up to 0.3. We didn't have that many outcomes on, on, on um, economic outcomes and physical health. We did have a few and projected economic status um, went up tremendously for what they basically saw them their, you know, in a kind of very subjective qualitative question, like on a scale of one to 10, you know, project how, what you think your economic status will be in five years. And that went up considerably. Um, we also see labor supply go up um, from reporting being healthier. And we see self-reported health go up. Go ahead. Um, I think the slide now just says everything I just said. Just go, you, I think you have to hit it a few times, yeah. So, oh, no, go back up. One more. There we go. So, you know, the striking thing is that we see that it works. And we also see that it does permeate to some other issues, other outcomes that were not directly part of CPT. We see improved cognition. Um, that one actually really surprised us. Um, this one was measured a couple different ways and both went up. One of the ways is to do a digit span test where you rattle off 10 digits to someone and you say, please repeat those back to us. And it actually made people more able to do that. Um, improved perceived physical health, improved economic activities. And like I said, one of the key results because we see is that we saw this impact for everybody, not just those identified as depressed. Um, so, um, so then, you know, basically, you know, putting this all together, where do I, where do I, where do we see this going? And we are very keen to do, you know, we're very keen to do research on this topic here in the Philippines as well. Um, I know it's been a while, but my, I think my last trip here, maybe it was penultimate, but it was back in 2019, 2018, we were, we were actively trying to look for groups that do cognitive behavioral therapy here in the Philippines to try to see about incorporating, um, doing some research on that topic as well here. If anybody knows of such uh, groups or opportunities, I'd love to talk. Um, so, what, you know, what are the basic takeaways that, that I have from what I've shared with you? Obviously, it's a, you know, these are all little piecemeals of, of projects. Um, but one takeaway is that capabilities are movable. This is not something that is just a given about fixed characteristics that somebody has. And, and we just have to accept it and try to work around it. That these aren't things that, that there are programs and methods to try to help improve people's capabilities. Um, that they're important, they can make big impacts, and that they're important for all. That when we're, when we're able to move it, we're seeing it across the board. Um, whether they interact with treatments, to be determined. We don't know yet on that. You know, the, what I mean by that is, like, do we see the, if we do a cognitive behavioral therapy and we do a, a cash or some sort of economic program and each one has a treatment effect of 0.1 does that mean that the two together we get a 0.2 a 0.15 do they kind of are they alternate paths to the same goal but they don't actually add to each other they just kind of provide complementary ways to get to the same goal or does it go the other way and it gets a 0.3 that um that they so um a second, a second point that I want to leave you with, and it's part of one of the reasons why I like sharing this kind of collection of things, is that um, you know, no one study is the end all, holy grail of research. Right? Um, we do a study, we learn from something from it. It adds to. I think a research is like a mosaic painting where we just added a little pebble, and we have a little bit more of an understanding of the world. Um, anybody who takes one study and says, great, I learned so much from that, we can now just get rid of all future learning and just start policy, you know, that's just not, that's just not realistic, right? Um, and so instead, what we need to do is share, replicate, iterate, share, et cetera, as we learn more and more. Um, data quality, I know this was not part of what I talked about, but I, it's so important to what we do at IPA and, and also at GPRO, which is the Global Poverty Research Lab I mentioned in Northwestern. We, we put a lot of effort and we're st we've started an initiative on methods issues, specifically about data quality, sampling methods, things, things of this nature, which um, to be perfectly blunt, get under, I think, under invested in. And I, say, I certainly say this within economics where um, a lot of times we're very focused on other aspects of the research process, and we need to spend more time talking about data quality issues. Um, back to policy, one of the things that, you know, basically our takeaway on these programs is that they're expensive, but they're improving, 
and, and we're learning more and more about how to make them more cost effective. But the, the evidence so far does seem to show that they, in the long run, the benefits do increase, I mean, sorry, do exceed the costs. And so they have a very strong positive policy implication for, for government programs and for nonprofits as well. Um, but they do remain to be expensive, right? So we do need, you know, we're continuing to do more work to try to figure out how to bring costs down. Um, as an example, the video that was used in Nigeria might be a path to implementing that kind of program at scale with, with lower cost because of the replicability of a video. Um, and, and so, you know, same basic idea uh, can be done anywhere if you have the right video. Of course, the wrong video could be disastrous. So, um, and, and, and videos take a long time to produce, produce well, et cetera. So that can be a, 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 tricky, a tricky path forward but one that I think does have promise for um, trying to improve some of these aspects at, at cost, at, at, you know, in more cost-effective ways. Um, I think that was the right last one. Yes, okay. Yeah, nice. Thank, Thank you, everybody. Uh, on WebEx, uh, around nearly 50 of them, and also we have some Facebook uh, viewers. Okay, so we will entertain uh, questions one at a time. For those of you who are here who would like to ask questions, uh, just uh, use the microphone. Uh, it's important that you are heard, okay, because some of our participants are on WebEx. Our first question is from uh, Dr. Adora Navarro, one of our research fellows. Go ahead, Adora. Yes, uh, thank you. Thank you. A uh, very informative uh, presentation. Uh, I'm interested in, uh, in uh, uh, your result on group coaching, wherein uh, uh, you showed. Um, um, it's almost the same as uh, the results for individual coaching. Because uh, Dr. Briones, Dr. Kimba, who's I think uh, is not here, and I will be evaluating um, a value chain uh, project, and uh, group coaching uh, will be involved somehow through uh, technical capabilities building for farmer organizations. Uh, we won't be um, comparing it with uh, individual coaching because that's not part of the project design. Uh, but uh, we probably could, uh, you know, um, uh, discuss uh, insights uh, on uh, uh, what elements are important in group coaching. Uh, what are we missing if we will, you know, um, use uh, individual coaching as, as a sole design? And uh, uh, how we can uh, make uh, group coaching uh, more successful. So, uh, can you hear your thoughts on this? Thank you. Um, so, um, no, I think you're you're asking all the all the right questions, which I'm not going to be able to. I, what I the best I can do is try to introduce you to the right people um, who, who ran the group coaching. Um, we did the same in the Philippines too. So there's some people that are, are local that did a lot of that training. Brock was involved in that with Dole. Um, and the people, what we could do with Uganda is, I mean, I don't know how much it'll literally translate given the difference of what you're doing, um, but happy to, you know, kind of get the manuals that were used that kind of guided what it meant to do group coaching versus individual coaching. Although I have a slight fear that the context of Uganda is going to be so different in terms of the livelihoods that were being promoted um that it might it might not be as as informative as you think um but send me an email and we can we can send those but i think the the local test that was done with dolly might be might be more relevant when you, what type of value when you say value chain what what are the types of livelihoods that are what what are, what are the types of um what are they producing I see. And how much of, 
So now I'm going to just reveal my ignorance, but I, my understanding, particularly at least with coffee, is that some of the some of the process in that value chain does actually involve cooperative activity within the community. Yes. Right. So that's a big that's a big difference where you know individual coaching, for instance, just wouldn't if, if the goal is to try to tell you know 20 farmers how to work together, then you obviously benefit from having everybody in the room saying here's Here's how you can, you know, you need to coordinate on your harvest timing and your transportation costs and things like that. So, so I think that one is a bit different and some of the, the answers are just more kind of obvious in the sense about what is it that, you know, why, why, why that's being done as a group. Um, some of the other aspects might be, might be, might be different, but if the program is not trying to produce those kind of psychosocial aspects, if it's just focused on the value chain, then I, um, I'm not sure how we can share with you, but I'm not sure how helpful that other aspect will be if that's not part of what the program's doing. Thank you for that. Any other questions from the floor? Okay. Um, well, I saw you recently. Okay. Trustee, please go. So thank you for that, Dr. Carla. Actually, I was curious with the, with the last project and how it's linked to. Um, and thinking of my policy implications moving forward, because the programs do have life, uh, life coaching skills. And you saw that um, cognitive behavioral therapy uh, helped reduce depression in the rural areas in Ghana. So would you be, is, do you think this is going the direction that uh, the life skills coaching should also use cognitive behavioral therapy in order to improve capabilities so that the impact of uh, interventions, of policy interventions, would be better. Is, is that the direction? You that's think? that's the question. Okay. We don't know what the answer will be because we need to see it rolled out with the economics program and then see what the impacts are down the road. Um, but even if this one iteration doesn't produce that kind of interaction, I, you know, frankly, I personally wouldn't give up on that thinking um, because I, like I said, like I wouldn't put too much on any one study. Right, but the fact that we're seeing these really big impacts at six months and the fact that we see these impacts in Niger, um, in my view, would mean that there's you know some some potential here um, to understand how, how to integrate that in with the with the economic yeah. programs. I think um, it's a very important direction, especially here in the Philippines. Most of my work is on the government, and we have a huge shift in governance right now. And it's all about capacity building. Uh, we are redevolving certain functions to local governments right now. So so that could also possibly impact that. So I'm just, yeah. I think that's a, you know, so you should continue work on that. As he said, it's going to be a long term, a long term thing. And, yeah. yeah, so I have one more question though. I was very curious about, you know, the labor leisure decision and then the income versus substitution effect, because we always discuss this in, you know, in the classroom, each is in the classroom, but couldn't it possibly, because you were looking at very poor um, households and individuals, that the reservation wage where the income effect overtakes the substitution effect is still far off. Uh, I, I, I'm i just curious. Um, so, I mean, for what it's worth, we, the, you know, the evidence for bid up the curve is, is the same. So, you know, cash transfer programs, which hit a uh, slightly wealthier, I mean, they're still hitting poor households, but, but they're further up the curve than the program I shared. And you know, there's a there's a paper which if you send me an email, I can I can send you that's accumulated about a dozen or so. I'm not sure exactly how many, but they you know they basically searched for all they could cash transfer programs and did a kind of meta analysis of what happens to labor supply, and no evidence of income effect um, kicking in and lowering labor supply. If anything, the evidence was the opposite. But you know, so 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 you know, does that mean that there's nobody in the curve anywhere? Like, but I think you know the evidence seems to suggest you got to go pretty far up the curve to start getting that, um, and um, if ever, see, um, because even like even if you go crazy up the curve to, to wealthy households, um, there the evidence is also not there that you know things like you know slashing slashing you know rich people work as they they you know either get some money from work or not, but in, um, for <laughs> or they burn out or something, but like, you know, this idea that like higher tax rates disincentivize rich working also doesn't have much support. Um, Thank you so much. Yeah.
Thank you. Before I call another on-site attendee, let's entertain the question of uh, Dr. Cruz Albert, um, who's uh, joining us virtually. Toots, go ahead. Dr. Albert, are you there? Okay, so let me just uh, read this question. Could you give us a sense of the results on the interaction effects? Or not? Uh, I, I spoke, yeah. What's that? Um, the interact as uh, results on the interaction effects. In, is that referring to the okay. okay, okay, he's unable to hear on the event, so okay. Um, let me get back to you on that. Uh, okay, which, which uh, things uh, he's referring to. So, Roel, could you please go ahead with your question? Thanks for that talk, Dr. Carl. And although I should admit, and this is kind of segueing to uh, my kind of methodological question. When I first saw the topic, I thought, well, what is this all about? It's only when you started explaining and unpacking with oh, CBT here and goats there. So I, I know as social scientists, we have this uh, temptation to always go for this grand synthesis. Now. And when I hear a term capabilities, I'm trying to wonder, what is that, right? I mean, it gets dangerously close to a kind of a vacuous notion like institutions or poverty traps, mm -hmm. right? So um, what, what are you trying to go for when you mention a term like capabilities and how does that general term relate to the actual cases that you are presenting or you have presented today? Thanks. So, um, no, it's a great question and I'm not going to be, um, you know, you know, I, I, at least in my own mind, I'm still kind of grappling with, the, you know, kind of a short, punchy definition. <laughs> um, the shortest, punchiest definition I give that I use, at least, and that I've seen others use is, is in a sense, um, how, um, you know, how well do you do with the resources being provided to you? Is it, is the closest you could think of it in from an e, as a, like an e economic modeling kind of definition that you could stick into a production function or a household? Um, but key there is that it's not human; it's more than human capital, right? So I'm including when I say, how well do you do with the, the resources being given to you? Human capital is one of those resources being given to you, as, and it's distinct from capabilities. So what is given to you is information. What's given to you is human capital. What's given to you is money. Um, earnings, savings, access to markets, things like this. And then the question, given all that, how, how well do you use these resources to, uh, to earn money, to be stable, to be resilient, things of this nature? Yeah. Yeah. Can I, can I follow up quickly? Please do. Yeah. So, um, okay. So you're, you're trying to present something that I have an inkling of what you're driving at, but Another danger I can see is that you might be close to trying to measure these capabilities based on the outcome. So there, there's an element of tautology there, right? Is there an objective way of getting that capability stuff entirely living into outcome that we can generate really technical hypotheses? Um, so I'm not sure how to call it a ton. Um, but I do think of, you know, one way of measuring it in, in an ideal world would be to say, if you are able to hold all those constants and just move that, what happens? And that's a measure of the improvement, right? It's not a static measure. It's not a measure you do with the cross-section where you have it in some cross-sectional survey. They need six questions for my measures. But that is a measure of being able to say, here was an effort to move capabilities, and it led to the following change in ability to use resources to earn money. Right. Um, the, the the closest that I think I see being used, and you know, but I don't, for what it's worth, the, the nominal, the way at least I talk about it's not these are not measures of capabilities, but there are there are some metrics that are that are often uh, used as I think the best way of describing is, you know, um, correlates or proxies or things of this nature, components, right? But it's not like I've never, like I've I've never talked about it as saying like here's a measure of capabilities. 
but there is mental health, there is self-efficacy, optimism, future expectations. And these are all manifestations of being more capable. Like if you if you do have higher levels of capabilities, you are, you know, then you should have higher future expectations for yourself. Right. So it's I wouldn't call the future expectation a measure of capabilities, but as much as a manifestation of having higher levels of capabilities and being self-aware about it. Right. Um, of course, you can go the other way around, right? You might have higher future expectations and be overly optimistic, and you might not actually have higher capabilities, but you just think more of yourself, right? And that's going to be, um, that could be bad, right? So by no means do I want to sit here and claim to you the future expectations is a measure of capabilities, right? Um, you know, in fact, we have a, a project in Egypt that um, I almost shared with you, like I was choosing between two things. <laughs> One was a very traditional, here's a paper, A to Z, on just one paper. And it's a, a, a basically a project of entrepreneurs. Where we have a battery of about 30 or 40 or 50 psycho, psych, psychometrics questions that were done at a baseline. Um, and they include questions that are things like, I wake up in the morning and I... Um, you know, have to do lists and I tackle them. Or when problems, um, when problems arise, I can overcome. Um, and a myriad of questions that are kind of of that nature. Um, some of them we think are best described as measures of optimism. Like I, you know, I will overcome problems, things like this. Um, and then the treatment was to provide them loans that were four times larger. These are entrepreneurs that were all borrowing from a micro lender. Um, and so the treatment arm gave them loans that were 4x, which is huge compared to what is usually done in the micro lending space. Usually it's, you know, modest improvements of loan size, like 10 or 20 percent. So it was four times bigger. The control group got twice as big, but the treatment arm got four times as big. And the striking thing was that we found was that on average, we found actually very little treatment effect from going 4x. Like for the most part, it was zero. A little bit better, but not much. But we found huge heterogeneity. People who were more optimistic did much worse. Right? So this is exactly why I wouldn't do, I wouldn't want to use like, you know, future expectations and say higher future expectations, more capable. Like actually, it was the other way around. These people were overly optimistic, and our interpretation is that they they got a loan of 4X and they went hog wild and made investments that were not profitable um, and ended up doing worse. The people who were more cautious in the psychometric questions and more, like, more orderly, they did actually much better. So we do actually have a very identifiable group of people who made a lot more money with these loans and some other people who made less money. And the average effect was, was a, a modest positive, but small. Um, so that's you know adds to the trickiness of your question, which I love, and I don't have a good answer for it. But that's I'm just giving this as an example of why I wouldn't call future expectations necessarily a, a measure of capabilities because people could get those exactly wrong. Now let's go back to the question of Dr. Albert. So uh, he confirmed that it's fair to the GAN case. Uh, he's asking if you could give us a sense of. The, the result of the interaction effects? So um, we literally, like in my flight over, we're like trading email and some of the stuff saying they don't have any effect. I would say the volume, they were, we were scratching our head a lot. There's some things we don't, some things go up, some things don't. It's not, it's not coming out as like this kind of picture perfect story. Um, and we're still, we're still trying to um, go through it. So I don't, I don't have a better answer. I'd be very surprised if something radically changes and all of a sudden we have a very clear, perfect photograph like picture of what happened. It's going to be more like a Picasso or a Jackson Pollock for those who are, are you know, I think Jackson Pollock at this point is sadly going to be the most likely analogy. So, okay. Okay. Let's go. Uh, thank you, Dr. Farland, for the presentation. And 
I uh, enjoyed listening to the uh, examples in the collection of studies, but I enjoyed your fourth story earlier about the uh, project that you did with the entrepreneurs, because um, that's actually um, my area where we're um, doing a lot of research on uh, MSMEs. So do you have, um, not that I'm ungrateful with a collection of studies results that I've already presented, but do you have other results or stories regarding um, uh, treatment or uh, to small firms or anything? Yeah. Um, so, so I haven't done as, as much, but I can, um, I can, so I'm going to give you a few kind of punchlines, but not just from my work, but from what I, what we've seen from other people's work as well in the MSME. We, we did try for, for what it's worth, we actually tried, we had a project here. We spent a lot of time on this one. This is um, kind of actually a little embarrassing how much, um, time we spent on this project and we ended up with something like. I don't know, like 12 data points. Oh. It was a, a, a credit scoring experiment with um, with a lender, which I'll leave unnamed, <laughs> um, where we went through a lot to build a credit scoring system for them. Um, and then they were going to go and market to MSMEs to, and then we were building in randomization into the credit scoring to see the impact of lending to MSMEs. Um, and the, the marketing just never really took place to bring in people, bring in businesses. Um, so I, I, I think it's a really important question about access to finance for MSMEs. And um, we have seen evidence. So, so we have a study I just referred to from Egypt. Um, I, I know of other work from Nigeria, for instance, that has found like pretty big impacts from $50,000 grants to MSMEs. So, you know, lots of reasons to think that capital is a constraint that the markets are um, not filling in that that gap for MSMEs. But we also see evidence that the issue is on managerial capital as well. Um, we've seen there's a very well known study from India that worked with a fairly large consulting firm providing advice and consulting services to a fairly small number. It was a Random, I'm not sure how they got away with this, but they randomized over like something like 20 firms and still managed to have precise enough estimates that they found statistically significant treatment effects. Um, um, we did a study that was smaller in the firms, but still MSME in Mexico with consultants and found pretty remarkable um, long run impacts on a number, um, number of employees, on taxes that were paid. Um, and, and so that was in Mexico. Um, so just, I think it's, you know, in a sense, it's, it's not too surprising that, you know, we're, we are finding at least and seem to be observing in a few different cases that the, the constraints are kind of exactly what we think they are. There's, you know, they need money. There was also some managerial capital. It's not easy to run a business. And this idea that, that like the only issue is, is money is kind of crazy, particularly when it comes to an, uh, an MSME. I mean, think about how many people go and go to business school, like why, why wouldn't we think that that would be the case, that they could benefit from some managerial capital and consulting services. The thing that I was always struck by with the consulting project that I did was there was this, I'm going to say this in a kind of a way that makes me, uh, maybe the South worse than I mean it, but which was these consultants had a really big impact on the profits of these firms. So isn't that kind of a puzzle? Like these are consultants who are giving advice to other people on how to run the business and they're making them a lot of money. Shouldn't they be like super, super busy? These consultants, like what's the constraint to the consulting industry? Like, why aren't they, why, why were they telling us that they were not like with a long queue out their door of companies and raising their prices and making, getting super rich as consultants? If, given how successful they were. So something seems oddly off on the market for consultants that I think is actually an interesting question. Um, we, had, we had tried at some point to do a second stage experiment on that where we worked with, you know, maybe it's information. Maybe people don't know how much money the consultants can make them. Maybe it's trust, you know, um, that they, they just, they're not willing to spend the money. They're not willing to put up the cost. Um, that suggests there might be a contracting solution. Maybe, you know, maybe consultants should take on some more equity deals rather than all, all you know, cash payments or, or debt deals. If, you know, and so maybe there's a way of contracting around that. Um, 
So. Thank you for that. Um, I think Dr. Urban has a question. Uh, I have actually two, two sets of questions. It's really the trying to grapple with the idea of probabilities. Uh, uh, the, uh, the framework behind it. It was, I think it was neat to, uh, it's easier to understand behavioral economics because somehow it can line it up as a question of incentives. But in capabilities, what's, oh, is there a upcoming how you line it up to be understandable to people like uh, and uh, it's easier to grapple with and, and that's that's one set of questions the other wait, wait, set, I kept saying understandable to to, to people who who or to analysts for instance like uh when you uh I I like for example I, I uh, I am behavioral economics. I said I, it's just a question of incentives. You just find the incentives, and, and that's you can you can hear uh, uh, if you have uh, people have problems with how does like mental health uh, line up with your own decisions and all of that. Mm -hmm. What are what what would be the underlying? Uh, you, because uh, it's troubles. You cannot decide when, or you cannot think straight because. Or is there a general framework for capabilities and your own uh, decisions, for instance? Basically, that's what I'm trying to uh, mm -hmm. like to go home with a simple principle, then deal with, deal with several of these dimensions of, 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 of right. capabilities. Yeah, that's, that's, that's one question. I don't know if, the, if uh, uh, I make myself clear. The other question is, is really a uh, how do you keep these things interesting uh, for for everyone, for researcher, for the beneficiaries, for the funder, for government? Uh, to do, like, for example, I had a couple of disappointing uh, experience when we come to uh, people disband and not continue on with possibly a potentially interesting work. Uh, I, I'm just did you keep doing this? And I, I like the book, your your failures <laughs> in the field book. Yeah. I hope you can continue that because it's that because I hope not. Yeah, no, 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 I mean uh, you continue telling that uh, so that you can prevent uh, failures. Uh, that, 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 that. I like the book very much. Yeah, as as uh, Thank becoming you. a manager. Yeah, yeah. You know, try to anticipate. So so here, uh, how do you? Uh, Continue the, the interest with everyone. Uh, yeah, I think that, that's, that's the, uh, the sec second question. Um, so I, I, I hope I'm capturing the first question right. Say, um, you know, I think of it as um, um, you, you know, I, I think I think the easiest way to think about some of those links from capabilities to to action is to um, you know think about one's own life or someone around you right I mean I think most people know somebody around them where who fits one of two descriptions where you know they they're depressed or they just somehow don't execute one of the two take whichever you want right where you just go like, yeah, I don't know what it is about that person, but they just don't seem to like get stuff done. <laughs> you don't know why, like, what is it? Like, you know, is it about time management? Is it about planning? Is it about something? And there's just some, they're just not as effective. But also think about depression. When someone's depressed, I mean, I know some brilliant people in, in my life who will get depressed and then just freeze. And not do things, right? And and that's not in our normal economic models of things, right? We don't talk about that, um, but that's that's the reality. Um, that that's the kind of link that 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 you know, in terms of real term, that at least that that we're talking about when we when we see the impact that capabilities can have on 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 economic choices that people make. 
Um, I'm not sure if that captures your question, but that's the way, that's the kind of link that I that I visualize in my own mind when I think about about what CBT and for instance is trying to do. Um, you know, CBT is trying to teach people about how to shift their environment. Like if you get depressed in a certain context in a certain social settings, well then don't put yourself in those social settings. You know, go somewhere else and just trying to teach that self-awareness about what, what triggers feelings that make you fat and then try to avoid things that do that triggering. Um, or it's trying to teach what, what do you control and what do you not control in your life? And then move the things that you control and accept the things that you don't, that you can't control. That's kind of one of those lessons in CBT. And it's, it's striking. That's not a very, that's a lesson that a lot of people who are not depressed can benefit from hearing, you know? <laughs> so, um, and then help you focus your energy on the things that you can control um, and the things that you can do something about. Um, um, shoot, now I'm forgetting your second question. Um, Oh, it keep interesting. I don't know. Um, um, you know, I think I don't. You know, I, I, for what it's worth, I'm. I don't think of the goal. I don't know how to answer that other than to say, you know, the the way I like to think about things is not whether they're interesting or not, but about whether they work. And sometimes that's not so interesting. <laughs> So sometimes, you know, so we have to, so the question in my mind is how do you keep people enthused about just evidence? Because sometimes the evidence is just, is sometimes new and exciting and, and sexy in a way. And sometimes it's not. And sometimes it's just, nope, we found out that works better than that. Let's go do that. Let's not do the other. Um, and so that's, you know, that's the key as I see it is, is how do you, how do you help build that culture of looking for evidence whether it's interesting or not like so you got to make the actual evidence gathering the interesting thing um and then um and then you know sometimes like you know quite frankly when i talk about the mental health stuff it is striking to me how that attracts a lot of people and it's you know it's more in it's interesting to think about um and people don't get nearly as excited about um hearing I'm guessing everybody in this room has heard the impacts of cash transfer programs before. And if I came up here and shared you, with you the 47th randomized trial of a cash transfer program, you probably would have been like, really? <laughs> really? I thought we, you know, and so, you know, that would be interesting if I was, if, if you were kind of putting them all together and seeing what we learned and stuff like that. But um, so there's certainly an element of that. But, you know, look, if cash wins, and cash beats something else, even if it's the 47th study. We might not think of that as so interesting, but it's important. And so that's, you know, at least that's how I think about it. <laughs> so I don't know if that's all. Okay, thank you for it. Uh, I was thinking about all uh, people who were the first person, I mean, the first, first person that entered my mind when you were talking about it is the market Yes. Yeah. Because it was the one that popularized Absolutely. It's founded on the uh, People's approach and in the context of poverty being or the deprivation and the capability to live a better life. So was he your I mean you you you, you talked about you know providing people with access to information and access to resources that can help them live better their lives. Mm -hmm. I suppose it's uh you know your explanation is connected to that. So ab absolutely that that is very much um, you know, very much inspired and, you know, forever in awe by, um, by much of his, his thinking and writing. And, you know, there's a second aspect that is important in, in what he writes about um, that I also um, think about on a personal level and not, not me personally, although I guess you could, which is, um, you know, kind of the, the title of his book, it, wasn't it? Development as Freedom? I think that was the title of the book, right? Yeah. Um, when we think about, you know, what does it mean to be poor? Um, you know, sometimes I'm asked this question and like, and um, I'm not, I don't always feel like I'm great at answering that question because it's not something that I like sit there and like have written, like, this is what it means to be poor. And, um, but I think that is, is really the best way of summarizing it. It's about lack of freedom. Um, it's just freedom on many different dimensions. Um, and um, that it's not, you know, but money to a large extent isn't about money. It's about the freedom to do things 
but that freedom also can be restricted for many other reasons as well, right? And so when we think about what it means to be poor, I think that's actually really one of the best ways of thinking about it. Now, way that capabilities is interesting is that you could imagine someone who is wealthy by the metric of what are their freedoms, but yet not seizing those freedoms, not taking advantage of them. And that's where the interplay is between capabilities and freedom. Um, now, whether you call that lack of freedom because they don't have capabilities, I don't know. You could, that's a semantic. I think of it as two steps. Like that's the way I would conceptualize it is, you know, freedoms come from kind of having rights to things and having the resources where it is possible. And then capabilities is the acting on those on those freedoms and the ability to, to seize those. Um, but, but yeah, no, but very much, I mean, you know, nothing I'm saying is I would claim is my own thoughts. Um, so. Okay, we have a question from uh, Dr. Maripa Lanisteros, our Vice President here at PIDS. You uh, presented a case on mental health and uh, he wants to know, okay, let me read her question. Uh, the state of mental health may change over time. How do you control for possible changes over the period of intervention? Um, so this is exactly, I mean, I'm not sure exactly everything that you're thinking about when in the types of changes, but my first reaction is this is exactly why we randomize. Because if those, those changes are things that are happening in the world that can cause people to be depressed or less depressed, those things are happening to both treatment and control. And we are learning how this program does in improving while all those other things are happening in the world that are beating them up and beating them down. Um, and that's why we run RCTs, is to deal with that. Thank you. Other questions from our live attendees? Anyone? Okay. So you don't have any more questions. And let me check on our on WebEx. Okay. So just a couple of this discussion. Would you have any final words to say to all of us? Oh, I like your la your the, the, the your penultimate question, I think, was left me with like the, my thoughts to leave you with. <laughs> that was I'll leave that as my closing. Thank you very much, everybody. It was really great to be back in, in person and, and see everybody here. And um so um and actually, you know, I don't know if you guys have all met all the people from IPA that are here, but if you guys want to maybe stand up and briefly introduce yourselves to us. Yes, please. Yeah. Uh, um because we are we are looking to do a lot more work like this in the Philippines. If there's if there's partnerships and ways that we can help with things you're doing want to get involved in things we're doing, NAF is the person to, to meet. Um, to Dr. Orbeta and to the rest of the PIDS for inviting us and for organizing this event today. And as Dean mentioned, uh, we have an office here in the Philippines and we're very much open to working with you. Uh, we would really like to expand, you know, our partnerships with researchers in the Philippines also. And, you know, Dr. Urbeta is really an example of, you know, one of the best researchers uh, from the Philippines that we've been working with for a long time. And now that he's president, he's no longer able to work with us. So he's recommended <laughs> other people <laughs> from PIDS to work with us. But yeah, we're, we're very happy to be here and we look forward to more partnerships with PIDS and the PIDS fellows. Um, I, our team is here and you can approach us anytime uh, and also email us. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Dr. Dr. Urbeth. <laughs> um, okay. Great. Before we finally close, let's give uh, Dr. Carlan a free uh, third class. And thank you very much to all our uh, participants on WebEx and those who watch us on Facebook. So this ends our webinar for today. And we hope to have you again, Dr. Carlan, in our future uh, events. Always a pleasure Seven. to be here. Thank you. Okay. Thanks thank for having you me. Thank you everyone. Enjoy the rest of your day. Bye-bye. We have uh, some simple snacks outside, so feel free to partake.